So let's get started with a brief history of ideas about identity. One of the first challenges to the solipsistic challenge is that we can't really know anything beyond our imagination, um, or no one can prove that we exist, or that others exist, or that this isn't all just a dream, was the emergence of, of humanism. And humanism was, of course, um, in some ways, a major challenge to a universe that was organized very much around the rituals of the church. Um, although it wasn't at the very beginning a break with faith, most of the early humanists were also um, deeply faithful, and much of their art was, you know, embellished some of the cathedrals of this period. In contrast to um, humanistic ideas, we then saw the emergence of the Enlightenment, which is characterized with much more secular thinking between the 1650s and 1700s. Again, still perhaps not as profoundly secular as we think about modern day life, but certainly challenging um, some of the long-held, strong-held beliefs um, that had dominated how we organized our ways of being in society prior to that. So humanism, as I said already, it emerged during the Renaissance, and its big thing was kind of not getting anywhere by putting God at the center of everything, by living in an episteme that sees, you know, the face of God and all of God's creations. Um, and it shifted to what can we know about the universe by putting man at the center of the universe. And I'm going to say man, although I generally I like to use gender neutral language because it really was about putting man at the center of, of the universe and universalizing man's experience in ways that perhaps weren't challenged until the emergence of feminism later. And we'll talk about that much later in the subject. But I love the image of Michelangelo's Vitruvian man here, which was really just an image designed to work out human proportion. But this man in the center of a circle, to me, really emblematizes the philosophies of humanism that emerged in the Renaissance. What can we find out about um, a world that puts man at its center and human experience at its center instead of God's experience? And we can see how doing that then leads to the next step, which is the enlightenment the period that was characterized by the emergence of the Academy of Arts and Sciences and um, um, a, a lot of scientific discoveries, the, the emergence of modern physics, the principles of Newton, for example, um, et cetera, et cetera. So you can see that by putting man at the center of the universe and thinking, okay, well, the world can only be apprehended through what man can perceive of the universe through his senses and then test it by logic is how we then get to the enlightenment and, and the predominance of ideas about science. And the idea that the world can be first apprehended through our five senses, through which we gather information, and then we test that information, gather hypotheses, and sort those hypotheses and test them through first reason and then scientific rigor is what leads us to the enlightenment and the ideas of the self that emerge largely through the philosopher of Rene Descartes. Descartes came up with what was subsequently called the Cartesian subject. And his famous saying was cogito ergo sum or je pense donc je suis, which cogito ir sum means I think, therefore, I am. I cannot for sure know that you exist, but I can know that I have self-talk inside of my head. I have ideas and therefore I exist and we'll begin from there. And so you can see that this is a shift from a kind of a more church-based idea of perhaps the, the, the Roman Catholic Church telling you about who you are and how the universe is organized to this idea that the self is individual, experiences their own individual encounters with the world, that the self is the same from birth to death, is therefore unified, coherent, that the self thinks, is therefore rational, is autonomous, self-determining, and self-authoring. And you can also see that there's certain things that are privileged in this view of self. And so people talk about Cartesian philosophy as being characterized by dualisms, mind privileged over body, thinking being what matters during the enlightenment over sensing, reason over emotion, and how cogita ergo sum can be very quickly assumed to be I am my thinking self, 
which is often confused with our everyday assumption that I am who I think myself to be. And Whedon says that our common sense ideas about identity, uh, the one that we're going to go about complicating today, come from the Enlightenment. And um, these ideas were influenced by humanism, a body of thought and episteme that predominated through the Renaissance, countered the ideas of sophism, that nothing can be known, of theism, and of solipsism, and had with it a number of these kinds of tenets. Like every set of ideas, there's always a pendulum swing and something that reacts against it. So along with um, the rational Cartesian subject, there was a reaction to that. So in the era following the Enlightenment, which was a period of great social upheaval that we've touched upon in prior lectures, we see the Romantic era. Now, don't let the Romantic word fool you. We're not talking about Valentine's Day, which is talking about an intellectual movement in arts, music, literature, and philosophy that emphasized the primacy of the individual and which was briefly aligned with or loosely aligned with the development of ideas about democracy and that fueled the French and the American revolutions. These were ideas that were rooting the self in sensibility rather than reason, emotion rather than logic, intuition rather than a deduction, and saying that in itself is the seat of the self. And it emphasized everything the previous age had not. You can see this image of Beethoven, um, because Beethoven is often associated in the history of music with the Romantic era. His music characterized by sweeping crescendo is meant to move people, characterized by affect being perhaps you know, the 18th century equivalent of heavy metal or Kurt Cobain, for example. Now, moving on, you can see that ideas of self, community, and identity change over time. And as Whedon says in the chapter that you have assigned this week, ideas about self in our modern era are often still largely influenced by the Enlightenment and by humanism and also by some notions of the Romantic period that we're singularly important political entities too, independent, self-governing, democratic subjects with agency. But however, perhaps counter to the romantics, at least in the academy, the notion that, the identi I, that our identity is rational still largely prevails. We think that you know, engaging in education makes us more rational, more agentic in individuals. And people kind of rail against the, the internet these days and all of these keyboard warriors because they say it's all about you know, the rant the art of the rant, people getting all riled up about things. Um, so perhaps we are, in fact, returning to an age characterized by emotion and affect and charisma. Who knows? You might want to have a chat about that when you think about self and community identity on the internet today. But even so, there were larger challenges to um, ideas about self and community identity than those um, that were given to us by humanism and by the Renaissance that emerged in the late 1800s and the early 1900s, such as the ideas of Marx and Freud that now may seem to us very old fashioned, but they were really profoundly challenging this idea of the unified, coherent, rational, self-governing, singular subject. So let's think about how they did so. Now, these days, you know, we, we might think that Freud's ideas are quite laughable. We might associate him with the Oedipal complex, this idea that you kind of like secretly want to bury or sleep with your mother and kill your father, or, you know, with penis envy, or his, you know, quite harmful ideas he had about female hysteria, that, he, that women fantasized um, ideas about seduction or abuse, um, rather than that those actually being real events in women's lives. But nonetheless, um, Freud was the father of psychoanalytic theory because he began to theorize a subject that wasn't simply the person we thought we were, our rational self. He began to think about the person we are beneath the threshold of consciousness and the person that perhaps is like the, the control center of us, the inner being of which we're perhaps not in control ourselves or aren't completely aware. And he broke this um, person up into kind of three characteristics. He said, there's the id, 
The id is largely present from birth, he theorized. It's driven by instincts and appetites, passions, and the pleasure principle, and it's largely subconscious. The ego, he said, is the interface between the id and the external world. Um, it appears to be reasonable, but it's characterized by pre-conscious rationalizations and fantasies that we repress. So it's a socialized being, a being that perhaps begins to develop as we go through early childhood and enter school and learn about social expectations and learn how to present ourselves in a world and perhaps to um, push down or repress um, our appetites or our um, you know, immediate reactions of just wanting to go screaming out of the burning building of the corporate world, for example. Um, it's the polite person, for example. Um, and then there is the superego, and he says the superego is the person who um, is just kind of like our best self, who internalizes um, perhaps cultural rules or morals or ideals. And again, we can see perhaps aspects of this um, dominating on the internet now, and you might want to theorize that. So you could say, you know, the, that best self, that fantasy self, that perfect pick that you want to demonstrate your profile on your Facebook page or on your whatever page is, is is not necessarily fake, but perhaps driven by your ideal, your your cultural ideal. You're trying to present your best self according to some standard of beauty or some standard of professional um, codes of dress, um, for instance, on your LinkedIn page photograph or something like that. But if you look at maps of the internet that show us um, the largest internet um, portals that are the biggest hubs on the internet that have tried to sort of chart hyperspace or cyberspace as it used to be called, um, we can see that alongside just your, your ones that you would assume to be the hubs on the internet, like Google or Facebook, that in fact porn sites are um, some of the biggest sites on the internet, which shows to us that um, the id is still incredibly prevalent on the internet, and, and perhaps it is the id that drives the anonymity of the keyboard warrior as well. Um, and it's interesting to think um, about how Freud is beginning to think of us as not singular and unified, but as having these multiple versions of ourselves. And then there's Marx's concept of, of identity. And rather than being concerned so much about our private inner lives like Freud was, he was more concerned about um, the community or people in community and changes he saw that were happening to community at the time in the advent of what he saw as bourgeois culture, the beginning of the moneyed class of people who were the earlier, earliest scions of industry, the factory owners, the shopkeepers, the people who had capital versus the people who were the workers. And he saw that bourgeois culture was based on individualism and competition, whereas he saw that working class culture was still based on community. Now, my grandparents in working class London in the 1920s and 30s were card carrying communists. They were factory workers and they self-identified as working class and they did believe that one day there would be a communist revolution that would overthrow their overlords. But Whedon points out that very few people in modern day Britain think of themselves as living in a class society, although in fact the, the conditions of wealth versus um, those who have not have not profoundly changed and arguably we may learn later in this lecture series are actually worsening. So what Whedon says is we may have an illusion that we now live in a classless society or that the markers of class are not as evident as they used to be anymore. We feel more that we are agentic individuals, even if we are not. We are under this illusion that we are. Um, and she also says we don't tend to encounter notions of class anymore, except for in an individual way. We don't see it as something we can band around so much and empower ourselves around. Um, but we're more prone to think of it in terms of places that we feel we don't have access to, fancy restaurants that would make us feel a little bit twitchy or uncomfortable, or supper clubs or, or you know some sort of society of something or other that perhaps we don't even know exists because it's beyond our imagining of the super elite world that's out there. Um, in contrast, Marx is theorizing a period of time where we saw a shift between people living largely in communities where they would live and die, where they were born and where their parents lived and died and where their grandparents lived and died and where there was a lot of continuity where people lived and in how people worked from generation to generation.
He said the advent of modern capitalism um, in industry was corrosive to semi-feudal notions of community um, and, and of community integration that we saw during this period, both for good and for ill. Certainly those versions of community may have benefited those such as you know, the lords and the aristocrats more than the workers. Um, but he still felt that there was a certain kind of organic community that existed in feudal times based on commons, based on kind of giving a portion of your labor in exchange for the protection of the lord in the feudal you know, living arrangement with the walled sort of uh, community structure that we saw in the slides the last week. Um, and he saw um, there was this idea of the common good that he believed was transformed by the advent of private property and by um, the acquisition of capital that now characterizes modern society. And he felt that um, this competition between individuals that modern capitalism creates was largely driven, as we talked about last week, by a false consciousness that workers enter into, particularly of the working class, thinking that their work shall set them free. But in fact, according to Marx, it's like a hamster on a wheel. You just keep working and working and never really get any richer. Now, whether you believe that people labor under false consciousness or that it's more complicated than what Marx thought or that Marx's ideas perhaps only fit a certain period of time but not now, what's really important about what Marx had to say about his concept of identity is that it's structures of economic relations that determine our destinies, our futures, what's imaginable and achievable in our life, and therefore how we see ourselves as well and how we experience our place in the world. Now, just as Weber came along and, and complicated Marx's ideas about power, for example, as we learned in a previous week, um, later German sociologists, Ferdinand Tonyas, also um, came along and complicated Marx's ideas about, um, about self and community identity. Um, and he was very much influenced by Weber. So he said culture is not just determined by the material structures of economic production, but like Weber said that traditional um, forms of power um, can still prevail. They said that traditional forms of organic community can still coexist alongside the advent of capitalistic competition, economic driven forms of society. So they said, um, and again, this is kind of like thinking back to Mark Granovetter, that social ties can be characterized by the nature of interactions and the roles, values, beliefs involved in those interactions. So they came up with two kinds of interactions. And of course, they're German. So one of them was called Gemeinschaft and the other is called Gesellschaft. And in English translation, Gemeinschaft is, is translated often into this idea of community, like traditional community. And Gesellschaft is, is, is often translated into society. Um, or capitalistic society. And you can see these root words in here, mein and shell. Gemein is more like, you know, your traditional identity of me, mine. And geschell is more like about, you know, the marketplace of selling and the kind of uh, identity that, that uh, emerges out of that. So in Gemeinschaft community, you have what Granovetter would probably say are strong social ties characterized by personal interactions, subjective feelings, tradition, family, neighborhood forms of sociability, people you see and know a lot, your, you know, your, your tribe sort of thing. And Gesell Shafti says is driven by impersonal social interactions. Now, he didn't have the word weak ties, but we may say weak ties, um, instrumental forms of interaction, um, often driven by principles of economic exchange or legal agreements or corporate contracts um, or the things that we do for work, and not necessarily um, for craft, as was once thought about in older ideas of community. Now, Freud and Marx and Weber are all kind of like founding fathers of social thinking. And we've all moved on since then, although their ideas, just like the ideas of um, humanism and the Enlightenment still influence us, taught us a lot of things and, um, and still have elements that prevail in contemporary social theory. So just in summary, what did they bring us? Well, Freud basically taught us that we're not in control of our identities, that we're driven by fantasies or subconscious rationalizations. Um, we may think that we're rational, particularly post the Enlightenment, post, you know, general universal education in particular. Um, but he said, you know, that appetite, that fantasy, and that ideal self never goes away. Marx suggests that we are determined by sets of economic relations, 
Weber and Tonyes suggest that we are largely determined by cultural ideals and the kinds of um, forms of, ex of, of social ties, I suppose, that we find ourselves engaging in, um, whether these are traditional um, or legal bureaucratic or, you know, we may transpose Weber's ideas about charismatic ideas there too. Um, so the big takeaway is that it's structures rather than individuals that shape how we think and what is thinkable. And this is where you get to this fundamental um, kind of dichotomy that is um, more often something that structures social sciences, humanities, arts, and creative arts than sciences. The sciences tend, not always, but tend to still be focused on the singular individual experience. They still tend to be focused on ideas that can be tested, um, that are empirical. Um, social scientists, arts, humanists, and creative arts are more often thinking about the sorts of structural, social structures we find ourselves in. Now you can see in this time we find ourselves during the, ep the epidemic um, that epidemiologists are also interested in how disease spreads through network um, structures and through communities. And um, you can see that all of this kind of really complex modeling shows us that it's very, very difficult when you bring these two things together. When you're trying to bring together science that is often based on empiricism, not just outlandish theories, um, but is also more often thinking about individuals than social groups, but then applying that to the complexity that we find ourselves in, in social networks and social groups. And you kind of get this like, whoa, what's going on? All, how, wait, one form of the modeling of the pandemic shows is this, another form is this, and these proliferations of explanations and ideas and contesting narratives, which we might talk about next week as well. The important takeaway here is after Marx, Freud, and Weber, we get to structure versus agency. And the theorists who come along after Marx, Weber, and Freud who theorize identity, we tend to call post-structuralists, which in, you, if you look up has lots of complicated explanations for it, but the simple way that Victoria explains it to you is it's just these are the people who come along after the prevailing assumption that it is structures that organize society rather than individuals who are so sovereign, self-governing, rational, agentic subjects. So their takeaway is that we are not actually totally in control of ourselves as much as we would like to think. And this is where Whedon says that identities may be material, socially, culturally, or institutionally assigned to us without us even knowing somehow. Operations of power place us and shape us through social and cultural and institutional settings. And it's these that largely determine who we are and how we understand ourselves in relation to others. And so let's break this down. If the questions you're asking are about how we are materially produced, you're asking generally questions about economic material conditions, and those would be Marxist sort of ideas. If you're asking about social or cultural ideas, you might go to French and Raven or Weber and think about that, or um, to ideas of Gemeinschaft and Gesellschaft. Or if you're thinking about how we're institutionally produced, that's where you might go to Foucault, for example. And so that takes us to um, the end of this part of the lecture, because the next thing that we have to start thinking about is social theory. So whilst Marx, Freud, and Weber tell us that social structures shape and determine our individual selves, they are not so great at telling us exactly how that works. And some post-structuralist thinkers have begun to theorize how structures determine the identities of individuals. And that's what we're going to be doing in the next part of the lecture.